and I have entitled this session, Performance Choices, with choices being in quotation marks, why we make them, the social meaning ascribed to them, and what we do, uh, what do we do about them. I'm going to introduce the panelists only because we have a very short period of time without uh, further elaborating uh, upon what I see as some of the problems that all of these uh, presenters, very distinguished pre presenters, are going to be uh, discussing. Teresa Biner is the Nadine Baum Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. She will be examining how evidence of a woman's dress has been used or not to prove or disprove allegations of sexual harassment. She will also discuss what social science has to tell us about the social meanings attached to dress and whether these meanings actually correlate at all with who is likely to be victim, victimized by harassment or rape. Martha Shamalas, Shamalas, Shamalas is the Robert Lynn Chair in Law at Ohio State University, and she's going to be talking about the origins of appearance codes uh, in early case law and how these origins have affected the development of uh, doctrine in, this, in, these, in these fields. Adrian Davis is the Reed Ivy Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina, and she is going to talk about the way in which women of color in the legal academy use makeup and dress to perform identity, the triggers for, the cert, uh, for certain performative responses, and the ways in which these performances Performances can be a form of rebellion, yet simultaneously uh, reinforcing of conventional norms. Barbara Flagg is professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis, and she's going to introduce us to two black women, Yvonne Taylor and her younger sister, Deborah, who had her name changed to Keisha Akbar. Yvonne has chosen through her speech, dress, and hairstyle to perform her identity within the bounds of con conventional white cultural expectations. Keisha, on the other hand, has adopted a non-assimilationist personal style. Both sisters nonetheless encounter the glass ceiling early in their careers. In telling their stories, Professor Flagg invites us to consider whether arguments based upon one, cultural pluralism, or two, anti-subordination anti principles uh, will best serve to vindicate Keisha and Yvonne's rights. And then finally, Deborah Zalesny yep. mm -hmm. is professor of law at City University of New York, drawing upon insights from cases involving equal opportunity harassers. Professor Zalesny explains how dress cases that equally burden men and women may in some cases result in gender identity and or gender expression uh, discrimination in violation of Title VII. So we're going to go in the order in which the panelists are presented on the schedule. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the organizers just really briefly and, and um, for inviting me, and this has been just an incredible experience so far. I hope I can add something interesting uh, to the conversation. Um, I've been thinking about women's dress for, and mine is particularly about dress, how, how we dress, not, not makeup uh, in that sense. Um, for about a year now, I, I taught a gender and the law um, seminar, and my students kept on coming back to the way women were dressing. Mm -hmm. What is going on with the way women are dressing? Mm -hmm. um, all this provocative attire, um, what, it, what does it all mean? How am I supposed to dress? Um, and uh, I decided uh, when this, this panel or this, uh, this uh, symposium was brought to my attention, and to, I guess I'm supposed to write about dress here. Um, there's something about this. So I did what I normally do. Um, I look at sexual harassment law. That's my normal area of, of, of uh, endeavor. And in particular, what does dress mean in sexual harassment cases? And I can tell you what I expected to find. I expected to find employers saying, well, she dressed that way, what did she expect, okay? Um, there's suggestions in the case law, in particular, Meritor versus Vincent, that a way women, a woman dresses, whether she, if she dresses sexually provocatively, um, has some implications for whether she's going to be sexually harassed, and in particular, whether she's gonna welcome sexual harassment. Now, since Meritor, um, Federal Rule of Evidence 412 has been extended to civil cases, um, that the standard in that rule is a balancing test, so it allows you to argue uh, about the parameters of, where it's, of, of when it should be admissible and when it should not be admissible. It says nothing in particular about dress, although the commentary does allude to dress in sexual harassment cases, that maybe this should not be admitted um, in sexual harassment cases. 
Um, but it was very much up in the air what the courts would do with dress. This is a, a classic area where you'd expect to see all kinds of differences of opinions out there. And what I expected to find was all kinds of splits among courts, doing everything from never allowing dress information in to allowing it in under certain circumstances to defaults to stereotypes, you know, the normal things federal judges do. Um, and I didn't find it. Uh, what I found was a, only a handful of cases that deal with the admissibility of a victim's dress uh, in a sexual harassment case. And I ended up sitting there thinking about, well, why am I not finding these cases? And I did, again, what I normally do when I don't know what's going on is I started looking at psychology and sociology, uh, interdisciplinary stuff about dress and how that might be impacting why we're not seeing this in the sexual harassment context. Um, and what I ended up finding was that, um, at least of my, my, uh, my current theory, although I've, I've, I flit around with a bunch of different theories in the actual paper, is that women who dress provocatively, and I'm not talking about women in the context of hooters or who are set up as basically sexualized in, in their attire, but a woman who comes to the workplace um, and she's a, you know, a regular worker, a secretary, and is more provocatively dressed than everybody else. Um, she's wearing low cut or short skirts, okay. Um, in that kind of context that perhaps uh, what the psychology suggests is that she's not likely to be sexually harassed. Um, that uh, sexual harassers are a lot like rapists. They don't pick their victims um, based on assertiveness, they picked it based on permissiveness and submissiveness and that actually provocative dress may well indicate that somebody is actually more assertive, more self-assured, and may not be a good target for your typical sexual harasser. Um, and I make several leaps in doing this in the paper, some of which are very <laughs> tentative. Um, one, 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 one thing that uh, we do know is that um, men in particular who, are, um, who do commit but more serious acts of sexual harassment do line up psychologically with rapists. They're on a continuum with rapists. They tend to line up sex and power. Um, and they're a very similar, uh, a similar sort of mindset type. Um, we don't have any information, uh, any, any sort of data about how sexual harassers in particular pick their victims. We do, however, know how rapists pick their victims. And it is, no, it is based on this notions of submissiveness and, and permissiveness. Um, they, tend to, they tend to avoid people who look assertive. Um, and that tends to actually uh, correlate, submissiveness and, per, um, and permissiveness tend to correlate with more buttoned up attire um, and not more revealing clothing. So I am making some leaps in logic there. Um, and just sort of putting that out there as, as sort of my theory on why we're not seeing a lot of, of employers saying she sort of asked for it like we see in rape cases in the context of sexual harassment. Uh, I also want to thank Catherine and Me Too um, for the invitation, and um, I immediately said, yes, I have to come, but I'm not going to present a paper. Um, and what I tried to do was really to read what I think is just, I agree with uh, Kate Bartlett, an amazing selection of papers and see whether there's anything um, after reading them that I want to say about appearance and grooming codes um, that um, if from a perspective of someone who thinks about the uh, kind of different um, uh, incarnations these codes have had. Um, and it seems like when I talk to students these days about appearance and grooming codes, they're very, very interested, but you have this kind of two reactions that have come up all the time here, that they're one, they're either trivial and they're also inevitable. We just can't even conceive of, of having a workplace where there wasn't. And I have to say that in so many different ways, the papers here prove that, of course, they're not trivial. I mean, whether we're going to use economics, whether we're going to talk about uh, natural selection or any other kind of thing. So, <laughs> but in terms of the inevitability factor, that seems kind of to be still something to, to chew on. So I decided that because it was all about, this symposium was all about cultural norms and cultural conflicts, that I'd try to pick out some case that I thought was sort of the most important early case, and it's this Willingham case, uh, to 
put it in a little cultural context and see whether it mattered that the first case came at that time, 1971, when the case was filed, um, and in the way it developed. So, because um, I still think Willingham is largely responsible for some of the some of the mess. Um, the case came finally to the in-bank Fifth Circuit in 1975, and at that time, that court, I clerked for the, that court at, the, at, at that moment, actually, was still a very influential civil rights court. Um, there were still the luminaries, the dissenters in that case, just Judge Wisdom and Godbold and Goldberg, but the court was also obviously at that making a turn to the right with the Nixon appointees. So it, within the court, there was um, this interesting transition being made. Um, and the case is, or at least has it come to be the sort of classic guy with long hair case. But as I reflected, it wasn't just that. When Alan Willingham applied to be a copy layout artist in a Macon, Georgia publishing house, and he was, after all, an artist of some sort, he had shoulder length hair, and the employer says, we refuse to hire you. Interestingly enough, they didn't have a gender specific um, appearance requirement. It was simply that the employer said, we don't want to be associated with people like you. It's going to offend our business clients. And apparently Macon had been reeling because there had been a, a rock concert there that uh, attracted over half a million um, folks. And in each of the court's opinions, they, they made a point of talking about the rock con concert. Um, that had, you know, there were beard and long-haired youth, scantily clad women, there was drugs, marijuana. So this was the culture wars of its day. Um, and so the case is uh, presented before uh, Judge Boodle. I wish I could have seen or met him. The name just brings on. <laughs> and I still, you know, I use this name in class as if I know the guy. Um, but he... He, his, the opinion is really an amazing contribution in that sense to the culture wars on one side. Um, he starts off by saying plaintiff is a 22 year old male Caucasian. Now it may be that this is still sort of deep south, mid 70s, there's always race identification, but I don't think so. I think that early on we're sort of told who's bringing this case interestingly enough, so that there's a signal that this case has almost nothing to do with equality. Because after all, it's women and blacks who bring equality claims. Um, he says that he's, he's making an argument, uh, he's affected a long hair style, choice comes in immediately, um, and that somehow the plaintiff has sort of thought that this is the age of the individual and he thinks he has some kind of individualized right, of, uh, individual right to wear his hair long. And um, Judge Boodle disagrees and sees the case as all about autonomy. And as soon as he does that, then the autonomy is all, of course, on the <coughs> side of the employer. Uh, he characterizes the employer's right as the fundamental right of employers to prescribe re reasonable grooming regulations, e even in this private context, as if it, you know, this is an old property notion. So I have to say, I'm so um, instructed by the discussion about maybe reformulating some of these concepts in property terms and thinking about who has the property and who doesn't. So uh, after Judge Boodle says this is really not about equality, this is really about autonomy, of course, he was the first one that, that, that brought into the, the discussion. He immediately raises the specter of the man in the dress wearing lipstick, eyeshadow, earrings, and other items of, of a female attire and says, you know, if the company can't restrict uh, the long hair, what are we going to do about that? Um, and, uh, and without citing any statutory language whatsoever, says that that claim, of course, would be patently ridiculous. Um, and the in-bank Fifth Circuit kind of agrees. Um, 
with Judge Boodle. Um, and I, again, I think this is interesting that we're not really at that point talking about um, focusing on what constitutes discrimination, whether there should be a separate exception for grooming. Eventually, the in-bank court, I think, feels a little uncomfortable, which is saying that would be patently ridiculous, and uh, kind of plays with the old sex plus stuff, um, which the argument originally was that if the discrimination was the, on the basis of sex plus another, char another characteristic, then it did not qualify as pure sex discrimination. The Supreme Court, even in 1971, says, no, we do recognize some forms of sex plus discrimination. And Willingham uh, says, well, that may be true, but the plus factor has to involve a fundamental right on the part of the employee, like having children or something like that. And it's quite interesting because, again, it gets all reformulated as autonomy. And only if the employee had a fundamental right would it counter the, um, the, the employer's fundamental right. Um, so what I wanted just to reflect a little bit about is um, I asked myself, I wonder what would have happened if the big case in this grand, big old Fifth Circuit that hadn't been split up to the 11th and 5th uh, had not been the guy with long hair who brought in the rock concert with him, uh, but um, a woman who wanted to wear a pantsuit to work. Um, and then I, particularly like those polyester pantsuits that I used to wear in 1975, <laughs> teaching the first course uh, at LSU. Yeah, they were sort of, I mean, they were much shinier than this. Um, uh, and very functional, because all, as ugly as the polyester suits were, they, of course, did help new token law professors like myself be able to look sort of like the mix. I mean, definitely it was a desire to assimilate. Um, and so, you know, these, these exercises are always so artificial, what might have happened. Uh, but clearly, it seemed to me that at that point, if that had been the case, it would have been harder for at least the, the Fifth Circuit to have dismissed the equality claims quite so quickly. They would have been able to maybe at some deep level see that, um, that a grooming standard was related to uh, the difficulty in having a woman break into a male domain. And I think, I'm not sure, but I do think that the sort of specter of the man in the dress wouldn't have loomed quite so large if you had had a female plaintiff, although we know that's the question that's always there going to be asked. Um, and so what I see so many of the papers um, really being ad ad addressing is, so what? So if Judge Wisdom, rather than dissenting, had written the majority opinion and had said there's no special exception for grooming requirements, we're going to have to establish a BFOQ, which had been his opinion for the panel of the court, would it have mattered all that much? Um, and does, in this sense, this artificial doctrine of employment discrimination in some way kind of shape some of the cultural interventions. Uh, you know, one thing that you could, um, that I thought of immediately is, well, maybe it would have just watered down the BFOQ defense. We know that uh, BFOQ has been at least somewhat of a very strong barrier because it didn't have to deal with these uh, difficult issues. But there's something about having again, just the same way it is in even individual disparate treatment cases, having the employer have to, uh, have to articulate how the dress code connects to the various aims of the business that I think might have been uh, very productive. And what struck me as, as interesting is that um, we know that if employers couldn't have sex-specific dress codes, they would, of course, like most employers do now, just have neutrally phrased dress codes. 
uh, appropriate business attire, um, wearing something that will fit in with the, the uh, environment. Um, and, I, and I guess my question is, is there any um, progressive potential to formal equality in this area? And I think the question was really answered in that in the Jesperson case, it seems to me that um, in the new era of branding, where the grooming requirement isn't really to signal the politics of the employer, because I think that's what it was used in Willingham. We are God-fearing religious people. We're not these counterculture types. I mean, whether you want to call it ideology or politics. Now that grooming codes are um, pro uh, providing this uh, branding function, I think the value of requiring them to at least be initially phrased in gender neutral terms makes it um, more difficult for employers to immediately use gender as a branding device, just as a device to differentiate. And I was very interested <coughs> in, in hearing um, from uh, Paul, from Harris, because it seemed to me that if branding really is about differentiation, it's not only providing who the company is, but also who they're not. We're not the Indian tribes. <laughs> We're not the uh, Bellagio, on, on the other hand. And that's where I think that uh, anti-discrimination law really comes into play. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, Catherine and uh, and me too, and I'll apologize in advance because I, uh, I'm not feeling very well today, but I, I put on my lipstick and I <laughs> <laughs> came on nice. in. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm, I'm very happy that uh, this symposium is, is finally happening because uh, uh, we went through a, a rough period with, with Professor Galati when he was trying to learn about makeup. And um, there would be many, many times he would just peer at us <laughs> for a long time and say, okay, eyebrows, no mascara, like stop, just, just, just stop. So it's, it's, good, it's good to have this finally over and, and, and result. Um, the, the title of this, my, uh, my paper is actually an exchange of letters with um, an epistolary exchange, to use the Victorian Term, with Professor Rob, Robert Chang, who teaches at uh, Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. We published a, an epistolary exchange last year that was about who speaks and, and voice in, in law school scholarship and other things, um, excuse me, in legal scholarship and other things. And in this exchange of letters, we're talking about the dynamics of race, gender, and sexual orientation in the law school classroom. And we compare experiences of, of black women and Asian American men trying to perform as law professors and consider how makeup and other gender tools both assist and hinder those performances. So I'm going to very quickly uh, read my first letter to Professor Chang, um, and, uh, um, and then you can read the rest of the letters later. Um, so the, for my letter is called Fancy Clothes. Uh, Dear Bob, a while ago I found myself in Neiman Marcus spending half my mortgage on a pair of shoes. <laughs> the trigger for this rather outrageous act of consumption, uh, an effort to quell the rage simmering in my stomach since my class the previous day. I had been lulled into complacency by years of rewarding classroom experiences, meaningful connections with diverse students at diverse schools, and more than respectable teaching evaluations. But here we were again, students eye-rolling, audibly snickering, sucking their teeth, turning to exchange not glances but outright looks with each other. I ignored them, I indulged them, I pretended like any good performer not to see or understand what was happening. I maintained my dignity and my professionalism, if not my authority. And then I found myself seeking solace in shoes. Both the reason for my rage and the therapy I liberally apply to it relate to the topic of the symposium. Makeup is one of several tools people deploy to perform gender and other identity. The Jesperson case illustrates their regulatory use to compel certain performances and behavior, yet there is another intriguing element to identity performance, and that is the impossibility of certain bodies achieving certain performances. I'd like to explore the impossibility of black women and Asian men performing certain identities, specifically as law professors, and the conventionally gendered tools we grasp to try to embody such performances. Law school classrooms are curious places, demanding odd performances from teachers and students alike. In the last 15 years since you and I started teaching, we have seen a lot of innovation in legal pedagogy. Yet the fact that remains that 
compared to other parts of the university, undergraduate teaching, business and medical schools, other graduate programs, law schools remain enthralled by various versions of the Socratic method. Although many of us would disclaim adherence to the Greek master, we still find in the majority of our classrooms variations on this mode of engagement with students. Professors assume the role as the repository of knowledge, which is often withheld and strategically and titillatingly revealed. <laughs> Much learning proceeds through calling on students and subjecting their answers to discernment, probing, and skepticism. In short, the students themselves often become the lenses through which the law is learned. Daily, professors distinguish students, contrast weakness and strength, build and burn straw people, and strategically time the gift of information. Authority and classroom command become crucial in this mode of conveying knowledge. Students often dread being called on or participating, experiencing classroom exchanges as humiliating exercises in which success is futile. Again, there's been a lot of insightful criticism and innovation, arguably some outright rebellion in legal pedagogy over the last quarter of a century. Much of it is focused on the deleterious effects of the old school and student learning, both substantively and in how it shapes their conceptions of what it means to be a lawyer. Yet the Socratic method is classically hegemonic in that its norms and values are internalized not only by those of us overtly wielding power, but also by students themselves. Many expect Socratic experiences, which they define as being humiliated. Pedagogy be damned, whip me harder, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so what does this mean for the bodies performing this authority? Years ago, when I started teaching, there was also some attention being given to the effects of classroom pedagogy on teachers particularly racial and gender effects. There's a wonderful issue of the Berkeley Women's Law Journal on this, in fact. I can't say how much this work meant to me in my career. When I first started teaching, students constantly challenged me, reviled me on bathroom walls, went to the dean with regularity. I don't doubt that I had some of the arrogance that can characterize new teachers, and that I had a lot to learn about both my material and teaching. Definitionally, all new teachers do. But I recall some of the instances as a mixture of the absurd and the dreadful. One very senior colleague who regularly demeaned and humiliated students in his own class, to their apparent delight, cautioned me he'd had a conversation with a student in which the student had described me as thinking I was bulletproof. Wow, think about that metaphor. In another instance, a student's father faxed lawyers at leading law firms in our city, a letter in which he accused me of failing a third of the students and conducting a property class in which I railed about busing, Malcolm X, and the Nation of Islam. Wow, again, I mean, I'm just not that clever, Bob. I was assigning Carol Rose and Charles Reich, but I hadn't, hadn't even thought to connect Malcolm to my first year property. <laughs> I'm just not that smart. My colleagues reassured me that they would defend my right to teach these things. Others said I should be, have been taken in hand from the beginning and assigned to use the casebook and teaching notes of the senior property teacher. Mm. Things got better. I got older, I got tenure, I grew and developed as a teacher in many ways. Classes still sometimes started off rocky with that old combination of suspicion and hostility and I developed techniques and performance strategies to overcome that. There's less of myself in the classroom than there used to be and than I thought there could be or would be, but I've become an outstanding performing, performer. I think I also convinced myself that my experience was the product of my times, just the product of when I started teaching in 1991. So back to my Neiman Marcus meltdown. A big part of my rage then was not just that I was having an off class, Rather, it was that over the last few years, I've been hearing stories about black women brand new to teaching, stories eerily reminiscent of my experiences 15 years ago. How can this be? How can it be that after 15 years, students with, one would presume, far more exposure to black women in diverse social roles could continue to be so resistant to authority performances in law school? And perhaps even more troublingly, the stories are not only of student behavior, but also of similar institutional responses. There's one more piece to my shopping as therapy anecdote. On the one hand, Makeup and sister devices are compulsory tools of gender regulation. But by the same token, my rather extravagant response indicates my internalization of identity performance. Many black women actively consume gender products and perform gender identity for racial reasons as well as the obvious gender ones. I'd like us to explore in our conversation how history shapes our relationship to gender performance. Early 19th century slave coats in the US prohibited enslaved women from wearing nice or fancy clothes. Danielle Tarazis Williams, a history student here at, uh, at Duke, is researching how late 15th and 16th century laws in Mexico also limited free black women in their clothing choices. And I have some other examples in the letter. In short, gender performance is intrinsically racialized in our nation, and many black women, myself included, sometimes find in the consumption of gender tools acts of racial rebellion. We also can find it therapeutic, a sort of soothing and indulgence of stressed out bodies. A tennis pro coaching me and another black woman was stunned to see how tense we were when he tried to correct our strokes. We both projected calm, humorous, relaxed demeanors, yet he just couldn't move our bodies. Our arms were locked like that. 
Similarly, black bodies are often associated with the abjection, the exclusion of things from the social order as polluting or contaminating. Insisting on painting nails or massages or nice clothes is a way of reclaiming our objective selves. Also, our bodies are still associated with service and menial work. In the paper, I have an example about being mistaken for a, a cafeteria worker who wore uniforms, and I was wearing heels and carrying my books and leaving the cafeteria with a cup of coffee, but you know, where's the forks? I don't know. Oh, I thought you worked here. I don't. I do work here, but not here. Um, finally, many of us continue to adhere to the culture of respectability, that performing respectable gender is a strategy of conforming to social expectations and defying racial stereotypes. Hence, consumption and display of gender tools, gender performance, can reflect rebellion, defiance, therapy, conformity. Any and all of these can be present in the same act of consumption. Um, I just want to read one final, um, one final paragraph. Will black women ever be able to make up with our students? And what about you, Bob? Part of the reason I'm sharing this with you is to get your considered opinion about parallels in our experiences. People rarely consider the interests of black women and Asian men as aligned, except in some generic rainbowy or community of color coalitional way. Yet, as you and I have discussed before, both of our groups share a common social positioning, the impossibility of performing certain racial and gender mandates. In a bizarre hierarchy of intersectional desire and performance, black women and Asian men have emerged as subfeminine and submasculine respective, respectively. Black men are just often seen as hypermasculine. Asian American women are viewed as ideal feminine types in looks and life oftentimes. But for both of us, it can be very difficult to achieve the correlative. This is the base from which we work. It is the base from which we make up our identities. Oh, I took the shoes back, but I did wear lipstick every day. <laughs> um, I, too, want to thank Catherine and Me Too for inviting me. Um, I want to say that Catherine and I went to law school together. I want to add to that that she's considerably younger than I am. I was, I was an older student at the time, so you shouldn't infer from this. <laughs> Um, <laughs> in any case, um, I also want to say, contrary to what Dean Bartlett said this morning, I'm actually not an expert in Title VII, at least according to me. I wrote one article on Title VII more than a decade ago, and I was delighted to end up on a panel with Martha because Martha coached me through that article <laughs> in 1994. Uh, and so it's really nice. It's, it's sort of my first visit back to it, and it was nice to have to turn up in a place uh, with her at the same time. Now, as, as Trina said, I'm going to talk briefly about Keisha and Yvonne. Keisha Akbar is a black woman who is um, a scientist. She graduated from Howard University. They're both fictional, by the way, but... Um, she graduated from Howard. She's a black scientist. She went to work for a small biotech firm. It grew, and when the time came to make all of the original scientists into department heads, she was not made a department head because the white decision maker said she was too different. Um, she didn't conform to corporate norms. She wasn't what they expected. Um, in my analysis, she wasn't white enough to become a department head. However, she has a sister, Yvonne Taylor, and, and Keisha's parents named her Deborah Taylor. She changed her name. Um, Yvonne is an accountant who uh, was uh, fired, if I have the story right anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, she was fired um, for um, engaging in billing practices at her firm that were commonplace. So in Yvonne's case, um, she is too much the same as everybody else, one could say. And yet she ends up being treated badly as well. Now, with respect to their per identity performances, my view then and now was that they are both performing blackness in different ways. They, um, Keisha's style is, I described as Afrocentric. She often wears her hair in braids. She has been heard to speak black English to black colleagues at work. She holds views on race that are not held by white people. That is, she thinks race is, is around a lot. <laughs> um, and so those are the things that add up to her being too different. Yvonne, on the other hand, has what I described then as a more assimilationist style. She, her 
her self-presentation is more in tune with white norms. And that is not to say that she's not black. She just has a style that is more comfortable, if, you'll, if you will put it that way, for white people, right? By, well, I'm not going to say by choice, but um, by, in her personal style, okay? Now, I'm very skeptical of actually of legal protection for anything. Um, I'm skeptical of legal protection for either identity <coughs> performance, although the article sets forth a way to provide some legal protection for Keisha. Um, what I didn't do, and you can read about this in the paper, um, I didn't suppose that Keisha should be protected because of her traits or her behavior or her black culture. Um, I did suggest that we she ought to have a right not to be white at work and that we could think about ways to protect her from uh, norms that impose whiteness on her. Um, what I want to suggest today, without going down that road, which you can see in the paper, what I want to suggest today is that we think more about the complexity of identity performance before we run around constructing legal protections of any kind, my kind or another kind or, or whatever. Um, and so I want to say a few things about the complexities of identity performance. First, with respect to Yvonne and Keisha. I would say now, I think I would have said then, that Yvonne is performing a black conservative identity, one that accepts some norms of the mainstream culture as inherently good, as, as valuable in and of themselves. Oh, let me, let me say as a preface to this too, I don't imagine that either one of them adopted their style in response to specific conditions at their places of employment. I'm assuming that these are sort of their personal styles wherever they go, whether they're at work or not at work. So I'm not supposing that these are specific styles that are somehow um, that. And I'm also, I also want to say by way of preference that I don't think there's some authentic self there. There's this complex production of self in relation to, in, their, in the case of these two women, racial subordination, in the case of white people, racial privilege in response to gender, and so on. So um, I'm not supposing that this, just because it's not formed in relation to work, I'm not, the alternative isn't that it's authentic, it's just a more complex formation. Okay, in any case, I, th I would describe Yvonne as performing a black conservative identity, one that accepts the many, not all, obviously, uh, norms of mainstream culture that we inhabit um, as good or valuable and so on. And so she doesn't have a problem with conforming to many of those norms, both in her appearance and per in, in her personal values in a variety of ways. And I would say that Keisha is resisting racial subordination. And I do say this in the paper. Um, that is to say, her emphasis on, or her construction of blackness and her emphasis on the sort of this, what I called an Afrocentric style, I believe is something she adopted. And of course, I get to say, because I created her. But <laughs> <laughs> right? that she adopted in response as a manner, as a way of resisting racial subordination. Now, what I want to point out right now, okay, this is not to say that Yvonne is oblivious to racial subordination, I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying that Keisha rejects all the dominant norms. What I want to point out is that I'm coming at those two characterizations from two different tangents, right? They're just, they're not, and I'm now presenting them to you not as two different pole, uh, two different points on one scale, right? But rather they're two different tangents. There's a world, there's a dominant culture there that we all relate to in one way or another. We accept, reject, or selective about, right? And there's a position relative to racial privilege and subordination that we each inhabit in different ways. And those are two different tangents that bear on identity performance. Um, so already it's complicated. You see, I don't think you can't just string the two of them out and say, oh, Keisha's less assimilated and Yvonne's more assimilated. It's not as simple as that. They have very complex ways of dealing with 
both the dominant culture and racial <coughs> subordination, and I could add a bunch of other stuff, right? Gender, religion, ability or disability. You know, I could complicate them in a whole uh, huge variety of ways. Okay, so that's them. Now I want to say one other thing. I haven't heard a word today yet about how we perform whiteness. And, and, we, and we know why that is. <laughs> so I don't think I have to even say that. But there's the same range of complexities in how we perform whiteness. Those of us who are positioned to perform whiteness, who bear that ascribed status, um, there's the same range of complexities there. So whiteness is gendered, it's classed, it's race, uh, well, uh, by definition, it's, um, you know, you, op you uh, um, occupy a different position based on ability and disability and so on. But where I want to end up is to ask us to think about how we perform it in relation to racial privilege, right? Though I think that is one of the most important choices we make in constructing whiteness. How are we going to occupy whiteness in relation to the fact that whiteness is a position of racial privilege? It's pervasive. Uh, it, it, just as Keisha and Yvonne carry blackness wherever we go, we carry the privilege of whiteness uh, wherever we go. And that, I think, is where we have to start before we start talking about legal protection for identity performance. OK. Um, I, too, am. A little bit under the weather, a cold mm -hmm. by the tissue, but I didn't put on the lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, what I'm going to be talking about is um, I look at the, um, my article looks at the um, unequal burdens test, the Frank's unequal burden test, and um, I propose an alternative approach to the test. I, so basically, I'm talking about why the test is flawed. Um, and I propose. Um, adopting some of the doctrine from sexual harassment law, specifically the law dealing with the equal opportunity harasser. Um, so in the one sense, you know, the, the, the topic is really short. Take the doctrine from equal opportunity harasser uh, law, and it's very analogous, and so I think it's in that way a good, um, you know, so I support my own um, theory. The problem <laughs> is <laughs> that the equal opportunity harasser doctrine is still quite unsettled, and so proposing this analogy doesn't necessarily get us that far because you also have to deal with the sort of split in the circuits and the, the, the mess of cases in that area. Um, so anyway, I'm going to start by very briefly talking about what I see as the problems with sex-specific dress codes, but I'm not going to spend much time on that at all since that's sort of been the topic of other talks. Um, but then I'll briefly talk about um, why the unequal burdens test doesn't address those problems. And um, then I'll talk about the equal opportunity harasser law, why it's analogous, and what parts of that law, that doctrine, that case law, that can be easily, I think, imported into the dress code um, cases to uh, solve the problem. So in, in terms of the problems with the, with the sex-specific dress codes, um, my paper just separates the cases out into two, two categories of problems or two categories of cases. The first is that the sex-specific dress codes um, penalize individuals who fail to conform to gender norms. Um, I think uh, Tristan Green was called them the assimilation demand um, cases. Um, the idea, of course, being that appearances are deeply connected to identity, and when you have these mandatory dress codes, uh, they inhibit individual autonomy and whatnot. Um, and then the second category of cases is how the dress codes uh, affirm the gender stereotypes that are harmful to women, devalue women, and, and feminized men, or men who don't conform to, to those um, gendered uh, masculine stereotypes. Um, so anyway, nonetheless, the, um, the, fr the, the, equal, the unequal burdens test, um, as you know, but just to show the comparison, the unequal burdens test says that um, a policy that has different grooming or appearance standards for men and women is okay as long as, the, um, as, long as they're equally burdensome to men and women. So um, 
it's sort of this kind of separate but equal notion that allows employers to institute a dress policy that's burdensome to women as long as it's also burdensome to men. It could be equally offensive to both men and women and be okay. Um, that's very similar to the problem that's been sort of confounded courts for a good number of years now with respect to this equal opportunity harasser. You have the situation Title VII requires discrimination be because of sex. If a, an, a supervisor harasses men and women, he's not discriminating. He's harassing everyone. It's not discrimination. Um, the courts are still sort of split about what to do with this, but um, and, and some of the cases still adhere to the sort of rigid, you know, it's not discrimination and accepting this defense. But there's a growing body of authority that really, um, that has rejected this defense and recognizes that there, it's possible to be sexual harassment against some men and some women in the same workplace by the same supervisor. And my article talks about uh, various ways that the courts, who, which are so inclined, have gotten around this because of sex hurdle, the hurdle of saying it's not discrimination because it's directed towards men and women. Um, so some of the things I talk about in the article, so I just do a survey of the cases, some courts um, just bypass the because of sex problem altogether or just don't discuss it, um, change the focus or whatever. Other, other courts, not necessarily courts, but some, I think this is more in the commentary. Um, I don't know that there's a court that's done this, but uh, have talked about this sex per se rule, reviving the sex per se rule where any sexualized conduct in the, in the workplace would be considered sexual harassment. So that would sort of get rid of the problem, regardless of whether it was directed at men or women or both men. Um, other courts have, um, and again, more commentary, and some courts have um, espoused a more complex, broader definition of the term sex to include gender, gender identity, gender expression, um, sexuality, all those sorts of things. Um, but the, f and, and, and the fourth way, which is the one that I want to focus on today, just for the, because of time issues, is uh, what courts and some commentators have called just an individualized analysis. So you examine each individual claim, plaintiff's claim separately uh, as opposed to comparing the plaintiff's claim. So if you have one man who's, um, who's uh, bringing an action and a woman in the same workplace who's bringing an action, rather than comparing them, look at each one separately. It's not really, you know, rocket science. But um, <laughs> it, it's, it's so, so actually the solution I think is, is quite, you know, I, I just think those cases make sense. So that's, that's what my article um, talks about. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the cases that have done that and then how that can be applied to the dress code law. Um, so I'm just going to skip some things. Um, Okay, so the individualized analysis. Uh, the idea of it is look at the, um, the reasons for each individual plaintiff's claims and see if those, those claims are based on sex rather than, again, using comparative evidence. And, of course, comparative evidence is not a requirement of, of a discrimination claim or a sexual harassment claim. And the Supreme Court has, uh, well, in the Onkel case and sexual harassment, I don't know that they specifically, it wasn't a, um, ooh, already? Um, OK, I'm going to skip that. Um, <laughs> anyway, comparative evidence is not, is not a requirement. I think that's pretty much a given. So the, in the equal opportunity harassment cases, the one case that I think is a good model for the dress code case, cases is this Chapuzio um, versus BLT Operating Corporation case. And that case involved a male, uh, male and female plaintiffs. Um, the, there was a male supervisor who harassed female employees by subjecting them to abusive um, remarks, sexually abusive remarks, and making sexual advances towards them. But at the same time, he was harassing male employments, but not in the, um, employees, but not in the same way. It was towards the male employees, he was um, bragging about his sexual prowess and also talking specifically about sexual acts that he would like to perform on their wives and partners and spouses. So there, he was sort of harassing you know, everyone or lots, of, or lots of employees, male and female. Um, and according to you know, some courts, that would not amount to sexual discrimination or sexual harassment because it was directed at men and women. Um, but the court followed, sort of addressed each one, compartmentalized the claims and addressed each one uh, separately and talked about um, 
the conduct toward the, toward the female plaintiffs was sex-based for the most part because he was a heterosexual male who was making sexual advances at women. He wasn't making similar advances towards men. So he was picking those women as targets based on their sex. At the same time, the conduct towards male employees was also sex-based because of the reasons that, you know, the, the type of conduct it was and how he chose those male employees as um, targets for the type of conduct towards them in terms of the comments, saying things that they could hear about sexual, act, sexual acts he would want to perform on their wives, et cetera. Um, so applied to dress code law, um, the idea is look at the dress codes. Sex, this is only about sex-specific dress codes, dress codes that require you know, women to wear a certain type of clothes and men to wear other clothing, type of clothing, or men should wear their hair short, you know, the things that we've been talking about today. Um, and look at the effects of the dress codes on individual plaintiffs. So um, you, you actually, we could talk about, the, I, I think it'd be interesting to think about the example that um, Patrick gave this morning about the red shirts versus the green shirts. Um, one way to look at it is just, you know, if women are required to wear red shirts and men are required to wear green shirts, women are being denied an opportunity that men have to wear green shirts, and so it penalizes them. It penalizes men who desire to wear red shirts, or was it green <laughs> shirts? <laughs> I lost track of my example. Um, uh, you know, taken a little further, if you have a grooming code that requires men to wear their hair short and women to wear skirts, Men, it, it penalizes men who want to wear skirts. It penalizes women who want to wear their hair short. This is the part that I think is the not rocket science part. Um, but so basically, that's the gist of my idea. Take the, take the better reasoned cases from equal opportunity harassment law and import them over to dress code law because it's the same conundrum, this idea that it has to be because of sex, that if it's directed at men and women. So I think sex-specific dress codes are always um, discriminatory if you if you're segregating women from men. So that's fine. Okay. We uh oh we have extra time. Great. This is wonderful. So there's some disagreement here in terms of how much time. Why don't I resolve it? End this session at three fifteen. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, my job is to regulate questions and to uh, initiate dialogue. So just to, uh, to begin the conversation and to touch on an issue that I think Barbara raised about the complexity of identity performances and a question that Martha raised about how much context matters, right? I'd like to return to Adrian uh, and ask for a response uh, from Bob. What did Bob say when you asked about the parallels between your experience as an African-American woman and his experience as an Asian male? And, and I apologize that this issue was discussed in the last uh, session, which I unfortunately I had to miss. Um, could you extrapolate from your experience in terms of intersectionality and talk a bit more about what may have happened in the Jefferson case, right? In terms of the uh, confluence of gender and sexuality, and of course there's no uh, line of demarcation between the two. You could argue that they're pretty much the same thing. But I'm wondering, when you read the opinion, um, I began to question whether or not the plaintiff was lesbian, not because I'm overly concerned about that issue, but because I was wondering if the judges were, right? Did her performance choices, and again, I put that word uh, in quotation marks, uh, lead the judges to think, perhaps the, the, the choice being not to wear makeup, that perhaps she was lesbian, and therefore perhaps the rights that she would was asserting were less legitimate in some way. In other words, would the case have come out differently if um, the plaintiff had been a mother with two children and a husband at home? I doubt that it would have come out differently, but would the reasoning uh, have been uh, slightly differently? Would the tone of the opinion have been uh, somewhat different? I'll just, I'm going to answer the first question, which I think in some parts answers the second question, which I think is an excellent one. Um, Bob, Bob shares in his letter his own experiences, and a lot of what he talks about is um, the inability that he has experienced and that we've uh, seen with other Asian American men of trying to achieve the sort of um, authority that both white men and African American men and Latino men 
can it get in the classroom? And uh, one of my close friends, who's a Latino man, tells a story of, of kicking a student out of a classroom and, and the student coming the next day to cravenly apologize. And I thought, <laughs> if I kicked a student out of the classroom, that would not be the response. Um, <laughs> nor would that be the response to, to Bob. But Bob also talks about how he, a big part of what he tries to do in his teaching is to do a lot of work around heterosexism and uh, homophobia and how that has led a number of students to uh, assume he's gay and how uh, this then leads them to, to make a whole series of accusations. He hates men, he hates women, he favors men, he favors women, um, and troubles in particular some of his Asian American students who are immigrants who get very upset then and want him to proclaim that he's not gay. Um, the last point I'll just make that he makes, which I think is so fascinating, is that when all this came to a, uh, came to a head, of course, was over his tenure mm -hmm. decision, because he had these rather horrible student evaluations from a couple of classes. And the faculty dismissed um, the concern over the racist comments, but was outraged about the homophobic com comments because they said, he's not gay. How dare right. students? Right. I mean, it was right. fine to be racist because he's Asian American, but but how dare right. how dare the students right. be homophobic and deny his him his rightful heterosexual privilege? And then the last thing he writes about, which I think is so telling, is how things got much better in his classes at a certain point. And he always thought it was because he got tenure, but it, it, that was the same point when he got married and started wearing a wed wedding ring. And yeah, yeah. Um, mm. so. Barbara. Yeah, I wanna I wanna I generally absolutely resist generalizing, right? <laughs> but I have to say that, that there's this piece of this story that, that I analyze the following way, and that is that law school stresses privileged people, right? Mm -hmm. And those stresses emerge vis-a-vis um, -vis the lowest status targets they can get their hands on. So those are gonna be all professors of color first right, with, with women of color absolutely first in line for this, and then all professors of color. And I just wanted to add that I know a story um, of, uh, uh, from not from my school, and not, I don't believe from a school that anybody at this symposium has worked at, as to my knowledge, but anyway, of a young white male who was doing great in his teaching evaluations, the students were fine with him for a number of years until he came out as gay. And at that point, nothing else having changed, his evaluations plummeted. So he became, in my account, he became a low status target at that point, and therefore can be the place where the, um, the pervasive stresses and arguably injustices of law school uh, now get vented by students, for what that's worth. OK, there are some other issues I'd like to take up, but I see a lot of hands, so I will uh, defer. Um, actually, I wanted to follow up, Barbara. You kind of ended your presentation on this. Right. Um, and, and you asked the question, you said, um, how do we perform whiteness? And then you kind of you know, ended it, and we <laughs> didn't, weren't able to really get into that conversation. I just wanted you to follow up on that in terms of your perspective. How do you believe that whiteness is performed? Uh, badly. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughtlessly, right? Um, I leave it that way partly because um, probably the main theme in what I do is to try to get white people to think about it for themselves, right? So I don't want to say. In recent years, I've taken to doing a little more moralizing in print, and I basically say you're performing whiteness well if you're thinking about race and you're thinking about racial hierarchy and you're actually doing something about it. Um, so that's, you know, so that's my norm for performing whiteness well and that's why I say white people generally perform whiteness badly. In other words, I want to define, I want to make the central norm of performing whiteness how we deal with living in a culture that is so incredibly racially stratified. Um, instead of doing what we do, which is not thinking about it at all because we don't have to. So that's sort of the, the, the basic thrust of it. But um, I, just as I don't want people of color to be responsible for telling white people how to deal about race, I'm not particularly interested in telling white people how to deal with race. I'm interested in raising the question and saying, how about, you know, thinking about it? 
Um, in terms of appearance codes, one thing that strikes me is that you know employers seem to get a lot of mileage um, out. Uh, <laughs> employers seem to get a lot of mileage out of this out of the sense that um, you know their customers will be offended um, by a man with long hair, um, and it seems like courts give a lot of credence to that. And it strikes me that um, you know do we really know that? <laughs> Um, you know, it, just, it seems to be a theme sort of running running through all of this. And of course, if you have an employee doing X, or I mean, take the example of a man dressing as a woman, um, that's suddenly going, I guess, you know, it affects the brand and it also affects people's purchasing behavior. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any actual studies on that and whether or not perhaps um, we don't give, I don't want to say, a customers enough credit, perhaps? I mean, is, is it possible that people don't base their purchases on the employees, um, and does anyone write about that? And would that be? You know, I, I wonder if courts would be um, susceptible to that kind of an argument. I, don't. I think there are whole colleges of business that spend their time thinking about, you know, in very concrete, empirical ways. You know, what do the customers want? Let alone every concern. And I, I, one thing I did. So I wanted just so to say that in. In terms of the, the anti-discrimination law cases, certainly the courts have not required, when, when customer preference has come up, that employers document the preferences. And I think this is the reason. One, in a very early case, the airlines had a survey, TWA had a survey saying, our customers prefer women stewardesses. And, and the court had a very quick answer for that, and that was that, in a sense, you've created the preference because that, the, you've segregated the job, you've given it a certain shape, um, and it just so happens that most of the airline passengers at, at that time were also men, so it was a kind of heterosexual preference. Um, so it, at some point, um, even saying that, um, the law students are going to feel um, discomfort if Me Too wears a dress. Well, it really just depends on whether there's a lot of Me Too's wearing dresses. I mean, that's the great thing about anti-discrimination law. The simple answer to we'll be in a worse competitive uh, position was not if we require all the airlines to do it. So in this sense, I do think that there's a special place for law which kind of stops the competition in this particular, yeah. I mean, it's a very simple answer to the, yeah. what do the customers want? Yeah. Yes? Just following up on your question about the, the mix or not of ideas about sexuality and with, with gender, and I think maybe you weren't um, here before when I was uh, talking on the other panel, that we made a conscious choice to, to the extent that we could, to not talk about Darlene justice and sexual orientation um, it wasn't part of the case, it wasn't part of the record, or at least it wasn't part of the depositions that were relevant to anything. But as, as a lawyer representing her working at a gay rights organization, I got the question from every single reporter. Um, and When you read the opinion, you think it's the white elephant in the room, right? Yeah. And you wonder how much <laughs> these judges are actually fixated on that particular issue. Well, and I would say, I think not. And, but I think that there was an interesting, important shift that happened from DeSantis and some of the early cases where, where um, a person lost their job based on something that was specifically gender related, but the protection that they should have had was denied because of information or presumption about sexual orientation, because of course only a gay man would wear an earring. And it just tells you what era the opinion was from. <laughs> but, but I think something that what was going on instead, or, or at least a question to think about, is the shift in, in the times and, and social attitudes that, that during, during the period of that case being litigated, you, you saw some courts moving away from the previous rules about gender identity. So you have the, um, the, the uh, city of Salem case recognizing protection for a transitioning employee mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of a shift in being willing to recognize that there's sex discrimination going on there in a way that was different from the prior law um, that gave an explanation of why you know, a person needs a particular type of protection. It's not that person's fault. They're not acting up. They're doing something that they need to do. And I think what, 
what I got from the questions from the judges, and the, you know, the, a number of them were very explicit about saying, well, employers have to be able to regulate the workplace. Are all these cases going to go to juries on the FOQ question? If we accept your theory, doesn't that mean there's going to have to be a lot more trials? I'm not going there. I mean, the question kept being, mm -hmm. give me a reason why, uh, if I agree with you on the theory, we're not going to have more cases going to jury trials. Um, and a concern about employers' prerogative to enforce rules against people who don't have a good excuse, they're just you know, acting up. And I think that's, so that's why we've got an opinion that says, give, give us evidence of objective need and right. so forth. You know, do more to prepare your case because we're not going to provide protection to people who are just idiosyncratic. If they're transitioning or if there's something else going on that they can't help, then you can have a claim. Or if it's something that a whole bunch of people agree about, mm -hmm. but the individual and the idiosyncratic person won't get the protection. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, this is a question for Terry. Um, <laughs> I found what you had to say interesting about everybody in your class saying what's happened with, with all the sexy clothing because I thought it all happened because I moved to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so evidently it's also happened in the rest of the country and I've been sort of trying to figure out what, you know, unpack mm -hmm. that. But one of the questions I have that I, you know, any, anybody can answer that I, I find in myself incredibly, um, I'm just incredibly contradictory of my own views and that is, mm -hmm. When the law students show up to do their moot court arguments in the little short, the women in the little short skirts and the things down to here, I find myself wanting to say, cover up, you know, and that's not a professional dress. And by the same token, feeling like um, I shouldn't say that uh, or I shouldn't feel that or, um, but I know it would be better for them if they did cover up. So I guess, you know, I'm just curious about how people deal with those kind of practical problems and, and you know, maybe put a theoretical spin on it if you'd like. Uh, well, you're not alone. Um, actually, uh, uh, in, in the article, I think I cite four different books that came out in 2005 alone trying to account for women's provocative dress um, and what it means, whether it's, and of course, you, you highlight the dichotomy. Is this empowerment or is this buying into your own objectification? Mm -hmm. And I, like you, go back and forth on, on what I think of that and actually would be very interested in and in, in what the panelists think on, on that particular point, because I have not come to a conclusion yet. And we have two more minutes. Um, I was just wondering if we were thinking about black women's provocative dress when we write these four books. No, no, I mean, no, we're no, not. We're talking about white women. Yeah. Um, I guess I, w I probably was focusing more on white women, but there are black women who dress provocatively mm -hmm. in in my classes as well. Absolutely, but I'm just I'm wondering I if these so books so. are describing a trend. I'm wondering if it is not a trend among whites, I, right, primarily. I think I think, I, right. I think it's I don't I don't watch Girls Gone Wild videos, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm <laughs> guessing it's white, but I'm not I'm not sure. Um, but looking at it, I, I would think it probably is yeah. a majority uh, discussion among white um, mm -hmm. white. White women. I mean, one thing that was actually interesting that one of the commentators on this, um, who is more sort of pro, let people dress as they as they please, has has pointed out, and this would su suggest that this is a is a sort of white middle class problem, is that this has been since the women's movement began in the 19th century, women have been debating about what is appropriate attire. It's not a new conversation uh, that just happened in 2005. It's been happening since you know, 1860s, 18, you know, as soon as there was a really emerging feminist movement, which would suggest it's sort of a white middle class movement. Mm -hmm. I, I would just say that I think that, I mean, I, I, the, the last part point you made, I think, is such an important one of what do I do, what do I say, because yeah. it really gets to, I think, the, the disciplinary role of, of other people within the group, yeah. right, the senior women. And in fact, yeah. it, um, at University of North Carolina, it was women mm -hmm. partners in law firms who told our school that we should tell the students to wear skirts. Mm -hmm. It was women partners yes. who yes. said that to us. And I was completely outraged, but I was pretty much alone, I think, not alone, but there were not that many women on our faculty who were ourselves outraged. And, I, and I, I think it's cyclical. I mean, I remember, in, well, it was in the 90s, but Alan McBeal skirts, they were really, really mm -hmm. short, and the, thing, the necklines were really, really low, and I think I even taught in a couple of those skirts. In, in retrospect, I think, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know what? The world didn't collapse, the world didn't end, and I think that it's part, that the, the gender rebellions themselves, I think, are become part of the way that the workplace norms get, get changed. Mm -hmm. So, 
I want to. Ref I think it's best in some ways if the older m ones among us refrain from disciplining the rebellion <laughs> some level. Okay. okay, I think that we're out of time. I see the other hands in the room. I said that I would entitle this panel "Performance Choices: Why We Make Them, the Social Meaning Ascribed to Them, and What We Choose to Do." Uh, about them. We haven't really talked about that last prong of this title. Uh, there are a number of suggestions in the papers if you read them about how we might move from where we are now, perhaps this focus on autonomy, to a focus on property rights, uh, from a uh, focus on cultural pluralism to anti-subordination principles, and so on and so forth. I would invite the later panels to think, think about how do we uh, move from where we are now to uh, a world in which perhaps we can provide greater equality and greater protection uh, to all people in the workplace. Is that possible given the social context in which we live and the complexity of these performances? Thank you all. <laughs>